Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you are joining the lunchtime webinar uh, here with Competitive Energy Services. Uh, I am Charlie Agnew, and uh, we'll get started in uh, just a few minutes here. We'll give folks some time to uh, call or uh, connect. A couple notes for today. <clears throat> uh, please do feel free to ask any questions on any of the subject matter throughout the presentation. Uh, we do ask that you use the chat feature for this so that uh, we can uh, sort through some of those questions and, and we will answer them uh, towards the end of the presentation if we can or, or follow up afterwards if necessary. But uh, again, please do use the chat feature uh, we're going to keep everyone muted uh, just for uh, administration here and uh, again get started in in just a couple of minutes so thanks again for joining and uh, we'll get started shortly Thanks again for everyone joining today. Uh, this is Charlie Agnew with Competitive Energy Services. Uh, please feel free to ask questions today through the chat feature. Um, we will answer those questions after the presentation today. Uh, topic is solar and uh, demystifying LD1711. Uh, what we'll go through today is really what you need to know about some recent legislation as an electricity customer here in the state of Maine, and further how you may participate uh, in these programs to either uh, avoid some costs or, or manage costs going into the future and, and also to meet any renewable energy or sustainability objectives you may have uh, within your organization. So we'll do a quick overview of competitive energy services. Uh, we'll then go through uh, a recent bill, LD 1494, and uh, renewable portfolio standard. Uh, second bill, LD 1711, we'll cover after that. And, um, and we'll wrap up with uh, how CES is helping our uh, clients in and on these uh, subject matters. So uh, we'll get started here with a quick introduction to CES. Uh, please do mute yourself, uh, ask questions by chat, and we'll get those answered at the end of the presentation. So uh, getting started here, some of you may be existing clients, so uh, bear with me. Uh, Competitive Energy Services is based here in Portland, Maine. We are a Maine-owned and based company, but we also have uh, an office in Topsfield, Massachusetts, and representatives primarily here in New England uh, with clients all across the United States and Canada. Um, our general philosophy is to provide high level of information, transparency, and uh, rigor in the work we do to align our interests with our customer goals in pursuit of um, 
both cost and sustainability objectives and um, helping to manage uh, energy strategy, uh, not only today, but looking out uh, well into the future. A lot of us, a lot of you may know our procurement work, you know, particularly electricity, uh, oil, natural gas, propane. Um, that is a core of, of what we do here and, and a basis of understanding what sort of energy loads and costs uh, that may be impacted by uh, legislation or market-based information. Uh, that procurement work is the core of our, our process here at CES, but may also be important to point out that we do a lot of uh, greenhouse gas inventory and tracking work climate action planning and energy master planning uh, in around these renewable topics that uh, aim to support our, our customer interests and are, are built off of the uh, procurement work we do. <clears throat> we have, uh, I think, 36 and growing uh, folks here in an office in downtown Portland. Uh, we have a weekly market summary uh, as well as copious amounts of information that we process here internally that uh, become the resources of our clients. Um, if there's ever really anything energy related uh, data or otherwise uh, that may be needed, we, we probably process here that here at CES. So a uh, lot of information and, and smart minds here working to process that on behalf of our customers uh, right here in Portland. Uh, we have about 360 businesses in the state of Maine uh, with about 3,500 utility accounts. Uh, as you can imagine, a lot of moving parts and data that we store and process here, and we've become quite good at that. Uh, we also do renewable energy consulting in, in many states uh, predominantly the Northeast, but uh, throughout the country as well. Uh, we've recently opened a data services department that uh, does support some of the uh, work that we'll describe today in, in support of uh, bill credits and, and um, utility cost tracking. So that's a new service here at CES and team that we're building to support uh, data management and um, also some energy master planning that we're doing for some of the higher education and healthcare clients of CES that um, is really long-term planning on reliability and, and decarbonization of uh, these institutions. So without further ado, uh, I will jump into uh, the topic for today, which we're going to start with um, LD 1494, this is a bill that amends the state's renewable portfolio standard, or I'll refer to that now going forward as the RPS, the renewable portfolio standard, which is the required amount of electricity uh, that comes from renewables as uh, required by state law to be sold within uh, our state boundaries. So uh, as it is now, we have roughly 40% of our electricity coming from renewables in the state of Maine. Uh, the bulk of that coming from hydro and biomass facilities that were built prior to 2005, those all fall into the class two uh, category for uh, renewables here in the state. And that's 30 of the 40%. Uh, the other 10% are class one or new renewables, mostly wind and solar that have built, been built after 2005. Now this new bill, LD 1494, amends the class one requirement or increases it from 10 to, to 50% by 20, 2030, which is uh, pretty significant, essentially doubling our state's RPS over the next decade. And that is in context with other states in Southern New England who have set similar and ambitious goals for 
increasing the amount of electricity coming from renewables. So main, uh, main policy now aligns with uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. And, and um, part of the point of this uh, or making reference to this or note of it is that we are in a, uh, an environment where there's an increasing amount of competition uh, in New England to uh, build or site these renewable energy projects uh, to meet um, state policy and, and objectives. So uh, the way the electricity suppliers uh, meet these RPS requirements is often through the purchase of renewable energy credits which are coming from these wind and solar projects that uh, are, are destined to be built within the state of Maine. So as you can imagine, the increasing demand is likely and, and will increase the cost of those renewable energy credits. And we've done some internal modeling here at Competitive Energy uh, in part because of what we've seen in, in southern New England over the past five years and more, uh, but also uh, just with our uh, own expectations of how much it'll cost to build these projects in the state of Maine. In tracking the, the green uh, line and, and bar chart here, uh, on the y-axis, you'll see the percentage, and, and with the green line, that uh, demonstrates the 40 to 80 percent increase in our state RPS. And for any customers, electric customers, that are not exempt from this RPS requirement, uh, the green bars represent the cost we project uh, for for compliance with the new RPS over the next decade. So 2019, you'll see the, the cost of RPS today is very low, uh, almost negligible in the price uh, per megawatt hour or kilowatt hour of electricity. Uh, but by 2025, you'll see that uh, we project about a penny or $10 per megawatt hour uh, of added cost due to this RPS. And five years later, around 2030, that is expected to double again, close to uh, two cents per kilowatt hour in cost to meet these, uh, meet, to meet this new RPS. So um, there are a couple of exemptions. One is for a particular type of CMP or Amera customer uh, that is sub-transmission or transmission level uh, service. Uh, they are exempt for the first eight years of this RPS uh, due, some, due to their lobbying efforts amongst the um, industrial energy consumer group here in the state of Maine. Um, and a, a second uh, opportunity to grandfather costs does exist for any customer that um, has signed or has an agreement in place uh, prior to uh, the middle part of this month, any supply agreements, again, in place as it is today um, for the term of that supply, electric supply agreement are exempt from the, the, the added RPS cost for the term of that agreement. So the, the, the message here is that um, Costs will are, are likely to go up due to the RPS, um, so you know it's it's important to understand that and and when the majority of these will start to hit uh, you as a consumer. Um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, also but but related uh, is the uh, LD seventeen eleven. Uh, this you may have heard described as a solar bill. Uh, but this, this, in essence, is the mechanism uh, under which customers um, may be able to or, or could participate in um, solar or other renewable energy projects. Um, the major uh, change in LD1711 is uh, that of the net energy billing program and 
net energy billing was established to provide some compensation to renewable energy generators that put power onto the, the electric grid, um, but may not have, you know, this may be certain hours of the day or, or days of the year where they were exporting electricity to the grid, um, providing a mechanism of compensation for that generation. And, and under the existing policy, that system, that generation system could not be greater than 660 kW. Um, and the number of accounts under or to which those credits could be directed was limited to 10. Uh, under this new legislation, that project size uh, has, the cap has been lifted up to 5,000 or five megawatts of capacity which the relevance there is these systems can be built at greater scale and, and thus uh, lower cost. Um, and also the number of accounts that can receive credits that, that allows a customer to uh, take more credits on more of their uh, various utility bills. So uh, those are the couple of the key changes in, in and under uh, this new bill. Uh, the credit for the generation and kilowatt hours that are put onto the grid has has also been changed and and assigned a value uh, or credit rate uh, based on a relatively simple but uh, will be a, a moving target of a, a formula which is to apply a, the standard offer supply rate plus 75% of the delivery rate for a small general service customer, either Amera or CMP. And the combination of those two um, costs is the credit rate for any electricity, again, put onto the grid from a renewable energy project. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. In addition to net energy billing, LD1711 creates a new program called the Standard Buyer Program, where the Public Utilities Commission will provide a 20-year contract to a solar developer or a solar project. And at a fixed rate for that 20 year period. Now that developer or that project will need an off taker or group of off takers. And the rate at which that project is compensated will be based on an auction that the PUC will administer next July. So this is a, a second opportunity or, or way or, uh, of participation uh, in renewable energy projects under LD1711. And we'll, we'll continue to explain this as we go on here. But one of the important pieces to this is how both the costs or payments and, and credits will flow. So in this visual example here, you know, the first step in the process is the construction of a qualified renewable generation facility or a project. Now that could be your institution buying and building this system or a third party that um, finances, owns and operates this renewable energy project. But that project uh, in essence would put electricity into the, into the grid, into the electric grid and under these two programs, net energy billing or the standard buyer program, the utility will um, provide a credit onto your customer, a customer's utility invoices. And this is a monetary credit. So it's essentially the same as a check being issued for all of the electricity that's put onto the grid. And that the rate 
the credit rate is again determined by uh, if it's a standard buyer program that you're in, that'll be determined by the auction rate that's established in July of 2020. Or if it's a net energy bill credit, that will be uh, a monthly uh, variable based on, again, the standard offer rate for the uh, customer account that's receiving the credit plus 75% of the uh, delivery value. So that credit will flow through to the uh, customer invoices and then the customer will uh, either pay down their own uh, debt or pay the developer back a portion of those credits and the value or benefit is in retention of any renewable attributes and also uh, any savings associated with a difference in the credit rate versus the uh, payment rate back to the project. Um, so, you know, a few ways again to participate here uh, in terms of how these projects could get built. Uh, in this slide here, we show one option being behind the meter, which is behind an existing facility load, where in essence you'd offset some of the consumption of that facility. Um, the other option would be to build the facility or the, the solar facility uh, remotely in an, in an area where there is no site load and put all of that energy onto the grid. And we see the direct to grid uh, approach being the most lucrative under this new program LD1711. The avoided costs of a behind the meter project we believe will not be as great as the opportunity to export all of that electricity to the grid, either under net energy billing or the standard buyer program. A third option, if you are a land owner, is a um, site lease to lease land to one of these developers who's looking to build a project. Um, typical development uh, features are desired, uh, that is, open land that does not need to be cleared or graded, has good southern exposure without any shading, and um, ideally is located next to some transmission lines or, or, or um, electri electricity lines that can support uh, that project coming online. So that was just a quick summary of the way these projects could be set up. Um, you know, one of the important aspects when looking at these projects is, you know, first of all, how do we size it, and what is the what is the savings potential? And the, these two are interconnected. Um, we've, you know, under this new legislation, uh, the underlying metric to focus on here is the amount of costs that cost or liability to the the electric utility that is how much do you spend on electricity with the utility every year so what what is what are you getting for cost from the utility and in this example we've we've got a 1 million dollar spend uh which uh, as a you know as a baseline here you know is is used in our example if if you were to pursue a, a project that would create um, one million dollars worth of credits um, we assume we have to make some assumptions about what the credit rate will be again under either standard buyer or net energy billing but if we assume assume a credit rate at a midpoint of Eleven and a half cents. That uh, a six point six megawatt or six thousand six hundred and eighteen kW solar facility, producing credits at eleven and a half cents per kilowatt hour, would provide a million dollars worth of credits, which would offset a hundred percent of your 
um, utility liability, and you would retain, in, in this example, if you could retain 15% of that, you know, that would equal approximately $150,000 in savings. Um, and there is also the opportunity to retain the renewable attributes or, or sell those for additional uh, project revenue. Uh, what we're recommending to our clients is a system size, maybe in the 70% or 80% range at most, knowing that if this credit rate increases or for whatever reason the utility liability decreases, you want a little bit of a buffer there to protect against a situation where you would accrue credits um, without any ability to, to monetize those. So this is really how we're looking at uh, sizing and economics. And there's maybe some questions that would come out of that uh, specific to your organization, but we can certainly help um, tailor this to your um, particular needs. A um, couple things to note about the timeline of 1711. Um, the net energy billing tariff is being worked on now. That is the rules uh, that will follow uh, LD 1711. And presumably around the uh, first part of December, we'll have some, some, fina uh, some finalized rules to, to work off of. Uh, everything now is is just essentially an assumption based on the the way the bill is written. Um, so we'll have some clarity to that in December. Um, there is also an effort to bring additional transparency to the interconnection process, and this is uh, as a result of some lessons learned in Southern New England, where the opportunity for constructing solar uh, was so great that there was a, a huge rush to uh, study and construct these projects uh, behind the various utilities. And the each of the projects, the, the solar projects requires some, you know, some easy uh, study processes and Others are more complicated to determine if that location could support uh, the project that was proposed. And, and this is an important part of building a, a generation facility is understanding if the, the uh, local delivery or, or transmission lines in the area can support the interconnection of that, um, of that project. Now, you know, in so much as the utilities are holding the keys to this uh, puzzle, um, they the the objective here uh, and hope is that we can gain some clarity as to where these projects can and cannot be built uh, through the uh, rulemaking process before the the water gets muddied by. Um, too many interconnection applications being filed to where the the process gets slowed down or or goes to a crawl um, and and may impact the timeline of the construction of these projects. So, a couple things to pay attention to there. Um, again, the standard buyer program uh, will. Uh, be uh, administered, the, or the auction will be administered next July. Um, the bidders will require a customer or off taker in order to submit a offer into this auction. So you may be aware or have heard from developers that are seeking off takers uh, for these projects that uh, will ultimately have a a price to uh, price to them come July of 2020. Um, some other things to consider here: um, there is a uh, a potential review that will happen once the net energy billing program reaches 10% of our peak load here in the state of Maine. So that's that's about 170 megawatts, we believe. Um, Standard buyer program is is likely going to 
while it will last a bit longer here, the uh, as, as it's designed now, there will be essentially five years of projects that will run through an auction process on an annual basis uh, starting in July of 2020. So um, that will be a, an opportunity uh, during each of these next five years. The initial auction will, in, in essence, establish the rate that is paid to those projects for the full five-year term. So we will have some transparency to, to that. Um, as time goes on in each of these subsequent um, blocks uh, under the standard buyer program, the, the uh, rate that the projects will get paid is a, is a, a portion of the initial um, established rate. So the best uh, economics will be in the initial uh, 25 or 50 megawatt procurement under the standard buyer program. Um, I've already mentioned uh, notes about interconnection. Uh, this can be very site specific and, and subject to added costs or delays if um, transformers or substations or, or additional lines needed to need to be built to support the project. Our last section of the presentation today was, you know, essentially how how could we help? Um, and 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 that uh, is a bit complicated, but we'll get into that in, in a little uh, detail here. Um, first of all, uh, if you're not a customer of C CES, um, we likely don't have any of your information. But um, for those clients, uh, you know, establishing an initial assessment of you know, what sort of project size and economics we believe could be attained in each of these uh, program structures, net energy billing and standard buyer, and whether those programs are aligned with uh, your procurement policy, your timeline and time horizon for uh, contracting and uh, ultimately, you know, the economics or sustainability factors that will you know either drive uh, decisions forward or 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 not um, we are active in preparing multiple uh, requests for proposals from developers for all types of projects um, from one megawatt to a hundred megawatts in capacity or or um, combined capacity for some of our clients and what we're expecting to come out of these RFPs is some actual data on uh, how much it's going to cost to build solar projects in the state of Maine at various scales, anywhere again from either the one, two, three, or five megawatt or the five megawatt uh, in, multiple, uh, in multiples um, under these two programs. So we are again active in establishing some RFPs and consortiums that are going to market and identifying projects and, and costs uh, for those projects. The next phase of, of evaluation would be in, in, in and of those bids and proposals and in assisting our clients with negotiating uh, the necessary contracts, and um, those contracts are long-term and complicated in nature, so uh, we believe that uh, should take a, a fairly high level of scrutiny in, in looking through those, those agreements um, as they are and can be you know, 20 years in duration. Uh, beyond the contracting process, uh, CES has has again built a uh, a team here that provides kind of ongoing project management or uh, re relationship management with the developer, uh, the utility, and an, an auditing department or data department that um, can help to track all of the uh, credits and payments that are 
necessary in administering these contracts. And, and, it, and I'll get into that a little bit more in the in the coming slides. Uh, also, the renewable energy credit administration. There is work involved in in uh, both creating renewable energy credits and if uh, elected in uh, to sell or market them, uh, CES is um, supporting our customers doing that as well. So just to give you a sense of how the money will flow here, and, and this is, you know, again, some of this will be established in the rulemaking process uh, by, by December, uh, but we've learned a lot from how this has been rolled out in southern New England. And so we think we have a good handle on how this will, will, will ultimately look. Um, what, what a customer could expect uh, when entering one of these contracts for a solar project to be built, um, and, and it may be more than one, there may be one or five or 10 projects that you seek uh, output from or, or credits from these projects. And, and each of those projects is going to have its own uh, host account. Uh, that host account will show positive electricity production, which then uh, by the good graces of our local utility companies, hopefully will make it into uh, your each of your uh, utility invoices in the form of a credit. And further, uh, you will also be receiving a, um, an invoice from the developer uh, to pay back the project once you receive those credits on each of your individual bills. Now, defining which accounts and what percentage of the project and credits get applied to these um, invoices is, 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 a, it is a bit of art, uh, requires an understanding of the, the account's load profile. It also requires monitoring to make sure that no negative balances are established. And this could be you know, any number of invoices. This, this could be you know, 10, 20, 30 or 40 um, different invoices, depending on, on how many accounts you, you direct credits to. So this can quickly become pretty challenging, um, but we have a team that's, that's got, a, got this licked and we've uh, established a service which helps to um, track all of these credits, make sure that again, they're being applied correctly um, as I mentioned, the net energy bill of credits, those are going to vary by month, by account, and we have to trust in the utility to apply those correctly on a monthly basis. Uh, but it's also important to extract that credit value from each of these invoices if you are, you are already tracking costs, because some of that can really blur the... Um, blur the historic data you've collected in, in terms of the costs on each of these utility invoices because you're just going to be receiving a, a credit uh, for the solar project and, and we don't really know what form that's going to take uh, yet. Um, lastly, and maybe most important, is the, is the invoice that you're going to get from the developer each month that's going to have 30-day payment terms. Whether you, you know, have received all the credits on your from the utility or not, um, so this is important to make sure that there's some sort of uh, reconciliation of the credits that have been received uh, prior to issuing uh, payments to the developer. So, uh, again, this is all just data and and um, process oriented. Uh, work, uh, but it's a service we've refined uh, over the past few years and, and are offering our, our customers who enter into these long-term agreements. Um, renewable energy credits, relevant to note here, some uh, may seek to own or control the renewable energy attributes of the project. Uh, those can be used to uh, count against your carbon or sustainability goals, and, and in particular, scope two emissions. 
Um, they can also be sold, uh, again, tying back to the initial part of this presentation today, um, the value of these renewable energy credits is, is likely going up. So it's, it may be something that you, you may want to hold on to and, and market um, or to retire and, again, count towards your inventory. But part of the work that will be required if you do own the RECs is to mint and track them through the New England Power Pool or Neepool GIS database. Um, everything has to clear through, essentially, this is the, the U.S. Mint of or New England Mint of, of RECs. And that does require uh, work. Uh, there is uh, steps that must be taken and, and deadlines that must be met in order to, to mint these RECs and qualify them for uh, official count against uh, greenhouse gas inventories or uh, to uh, transfer those to a, a buyer of the RECs. And again, those those RECs are, are valuable uh, due to the compliance obligations uh, under this new RPS. Um, so they can be sold in the state of Maine, they can be sold uh, in Massachusetts or elsewhere in New England, uh, depending on uh, where the, the best value is um, at the time. Um, so just to kind of sum, sum things up, uh, it is a sunny day here today and in Maine um, in general. So uh, we've got uh, opportunities, I think, for those that are interested in participating in either one-off uh, RFPs or in what we're calling our consortium RFPs for larger uh, five megawatt or greater uh, projects that will be net metered or uh, under the standard buyer program, and we're seeking scale of multiple and large large off takers to, um, we think, find the best price and, and opportunity in the marketplace. And and uh, the timing is relevant uh, again for a number of reasons. These programs we think are going to be uh, most lucrative on on the front end. So we're we're trying to take action quickly. Um, but keeping in mind that some of these credit values, at least for net energy billing, uh, will not be known till towards the end of the year. Um, and that uh, for the standard buyer program is, is out to 20, mid-2020. Um, but for those that are interested, uh, we are happy to have further discussion and um, answer any questions you guys have about this and help weigh the risks and and determine how this fits into uh, your strategic energy objectives overall. So um, appreciate everyone's time here. And um, I'll just take a look at uh, um, some of the questions that have come in. Um, okay, so yeah, just administratively, we were, we we're happy to send and will send this uh, presentation out to everyone uh, after today. So uh, keep an eye out on your uh, email for that. And another question about um, leasing. Uh, uh, so, yep, re with regard to leasing, you know, that is not necessarily something that uh, we are helping with. This is more of a um, a real estate transaction. We, we certainly have and know of um, multiple developers who are shopping for uh, space uh, to build these projects. And again, I, ideally, they are going to be you know, 25 acres or more uh, of flat, easily developable land uh, with access to transmission and you know really they're looking for the lowest possible cost so you know th this this might be a, a sand pit uh, you know but if or, or something to that effect or a farm field um, but you know for those that are looking to optimize value of your land uh, certainly in in developable areas this may not be the most lucrative opportunity we, we expect these 
projects are going to get built on inexpensive, you know, rural farmland um, in in kind of the more rural parts of the state. But um, nonetheless, there there are opportunities out there. Um, should you be interested, and we can you know put you in touch with some of the folks who are looking to to develop those projects if you'd like. Uh, another question about um, contract term length uh, under this uh, law uh, for the standard buyer program. Uh, the tw 20 years is the the contract term for the standard buyer program. Um, the developer agreements we expect from uh, other participants in say net energy bill that look for net energy billing projects. Uh, we also expect to be uh, 20 to 25 years. So looks like that uh, answers all the questions. Uh, but for those that do not, uh, we'll we'll have our contact information shared with everyone. And um, appreciate everyone's time today, and and thanks for your participation. I'll uh, hang on the line here if any other questions come in, but. Um, yeah, have a nice day and, and thanks for uh, joining.